Okay, we're going to get started now. Hello, and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Paul Rosen, and I am the Executive Chairman of Global Go, the cannabis industry's leading global advisory. I've been an entrepreneur and an executive in the regulated cannabis industry, industry since 2012, and I've been a cannabis enthusiast since 1978. I can imagine we are all amazed and delighted by how quickly the cannabis industry has transitioned itself from a basement industry mired in controversy to a global concern, transforming the health and wellness of hundreds of millions of patients and citizens across the planet, while also providing a much needed economic boost to regional economies all over the world. On behalf of Global Go, welcome again to our webinar series Today's topic is institutional capital arrives to advance European cannabis. Europe is universally recognized as one of the largest and most dynamic markets for the commercialization of cannabis and hemp anywhere in the world. With a population of over 740 million individuals and a total cannabis market estimated to be worth up to 123 billion euro by 2028, Europe is on track to become one of the world's largest legal cannabis markets within the next five years. In fact, over 500 million euro has already been invested in European cannabis businesses to date. It would be fair to note that so far, the actual economics of European cannabis have lagged behind the excitement. But as you will learn today, that's on the verge of changing. Since the multi-jurisdictional nature of Europe makes it a complex market, today's keynote and panel will focus on lessons learned from the established regulated markets as industry players look for advantageous opportunities to advance European cannabis. We have an incredible collection of some of the leading market participants active in Europe today, and I'm certain you will find today's content both informative and stimulating. Just before we commence our program, in lieu of a webinar registration fee, we are encouraging each attendee to consider making a donation of up to $100 or more to The Last Prisoners Project. The Last Prisoners Project is a coalition of cannabis industry leaders, executives, and artists dedicated to bringing restorative justice to the cannabis industry. Last Prisoners Project is dedicated to releasing cannabis prisoners and helping them rebuild their lives after they are unincarcerated. It's a really, really, really important cause, perhaps the industry's most important cause, and I encourage everyone to try to dig deep during the holiday season and make a donation. With that being said, let's get on to our program. I'm so pleased to welcome our keynote speaker today, Mr. Antonio Constanzo. Antonio is the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of EMAC Life Sciences, one of Europe's leading cannabis companies. Prior to EMAC, Antonio co-founded and was Head of International Development at Nuvera, a publicly listed Canadian cannabis corporation ultimately acquired by Afria. Prior to focusing on the cannabis industry, Antonio was Head of Public Policy and Government Relations at Uber. So we can all thank Antonio for the transportation that we all rely upon daily right now. He formerly spent 10 years in the online gaming industry as Director of International Development and Regulatory Affairs at BWIN, and for five years as Vice Chairman and Board Director at ESA, a sports betting integrity agency. Uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Antonio Constanzo. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Global Go for organizing the webinar and inviting me to introduce it. So my name is Antonio Costanzo. I am the co-founder and CEO of EMAC Life Sciences, which is the only vertically integrated and multinational European cannabis company with cultivation and manufacturing sites in Portugal, Spain, and the UK, and five importation and distribution licenses directly controlled in key jurisdictions. The topic we are treating today is of the highest importance, I think, because it deals with the present and the future of the European cannabis industry. Almost three years ago, when I co-founded EMAC, the European cannabis industry was nascent and with one exception, was being developed by Canadian companies. 
Since then, the publicly listed Canadian companies have been retreating from Europe and focusing their efforts on their domestic market as they have, they have all uh, publicly stated. And a European ecosystem has been developing with a number of companies that have built real businesses in various countries. They have done so in large proportion thanks to the investment of high net worth individuals, family offices and venture capital firms, as you would expect in a nascent industry. There has been no shortage of capital, to be clear. AMAC itself has raised almost 50 million pounds since its launch three years ago. But the big institutional investors, for the most part, have been waiting to understand how players and the market would evolve. And in certain cases, they have been waiting also for regulatory certainty. There were questions, I remember, already two years ago around the Proceeds of a Crime Act in the UK questions on whether a fund based in a country where medical cannabis is not permitted yet could invest in a company based and operating legally in another jurisdiction. Uh, questions over federal illegality in the US and the consequences for investors from the US to Europe, over the novel food regulation, the United Nations positions, and so on. All these points have now been treated and there is clarity today. Let's start with the UN. The UN have adopted the recommendation of the World Health Organization last week and removed cannabis from Schedule 4 of the Convention on Controlled Substances, recognizing the medical and scientific interest and value of cannabis. This is a major, major political decision that will provide comfort and guidance to regulators across the world and we'll ex we expect will also provide uh, have a significant practical impact, accelerating the opening of certain markets to medical use. Last month, the European Court of Justice ruled in a French case on CBD products that CBD should not be treated as a narcotic substance and can, really, can be freely traded across EU member states. As a consequence, the European Commission have taken the same approach and have confirmed CBD can go through a novel food approval process. And this provides fantastic perspectives for the European CBD wellness industry. At the end of September, the Financial Conduct Authority, the UK body that regulates financial markets and public company, companies, uh, publicly stated that the UK uh, stock exchange is open for business for medical cannabis companies, clarifying the interpretation of the Proceeds of Crime Act and paving the way effectively for a number of listings that are already in the pipeline. But as I said, the desire for clarity from institutional investors was not only on the regulatory side. They also wanted to see how the market would play out. Would countries open to medical cannabis and wellness products for commercial purposes? Would patients, doctors, the medical community at large embrace the use of cannabis? Would companies be able to compete against the Canadian giants? All the answers to those questions are positive. Germany has proven to be a fast growing market with tens of thousands of patients already using medical cannabis and a growth trajectory that has only been slowed down by the COVID pandemic. By the way, talking about COVID and the pandemic, that has proven that medical cannabis is here to stay as it was treated by governments across the world and not just in Europe as a real medicinal product, part of the essential services and products that should be guaranteed in any instances, including where the toughest restrictions to personal freedoms were imposed. Going back to the UK countries, uh, to the European countries, the UK allowed uh, the use of medical cannabis two years ago, and we're now seeing the traction and the growth that was seen in Canada and in Australia similar, at similar stages uh, of the market development. Doctors are getting comfortable prescribing. There is a constant quality supply available and prices have been going down. Let's not forget, there are 1.4 million self-medicating pa self patients that have been buying their products in the illegal market, and now they're able to start transitioning to a safe legal offer. In Italy, the amount of product dispensed in the last three years has doubled year on year, and the demand keeps growing with more doctors prescribing the product. France is starting its medical cannabis trial in Q1 2021, with a view to a full market opening in 18 months. Malta, Poland, Czech Republic, Ireland, Greece, Poland, uh, Switzerland, Denmark, they all have introduced medical cannabis programs and are in the process of making access to the product for patients and doctors easier and more stable. Some people, as Paul did, have underlined that the European medical market has not developed as fast as expected. But that is often the case in my view when 
we're talking about newly regulated industries. Politicians and regulators have had to become uh, comfortable with something that was illegal for more than 70 years across the world. They've had to understand how they should regulate medical cannabis, if they should treat it as a traditional medicine or develop a dedicated path to market. The most important element here is that with a very few exceptions, there is no pushback from regulators to introduce the use of medical cannabis. It is not about if, but only about when and how. And this is a major difference with other new developing industries I have been involved with in the past, like online gaming on, or ride sharing. We had to fight governments then because they did not want to open those markets. We are now working with governments to make medical cannabis accessible to patients. Fantastic difference. Proof is that more and more conversations are also happening and projects are being discussed about the legalization of recreational use in various countries in Europe. The Netherlands, the Netherlands are currently going through a tender process for a recreational pilot project that is due to start next year. Switzerland is working on a similar pilot project that is very close to full political approval in parliament. Luxembourg have announced their intention to regulate recreational use by 2022, 2023. There are draft laws in Parliament in Italy, Portugal, Spain, and other countries that could lead to important changes in the next two to three years. We should not forget that Europe has the, one of the highest usage rate of cannabis in the world. 23 million people in the EU have used cannabis in the last 12 months. Four countries have a prevalence rate of 10% or more, and 17 countries in Europe have a prevalence rate of 5% or more. I would add that the wider European opportunity is also completed by Israel, where there are 80,000 patients already and where the government have announced that their intention is to legalize recreational use shortly. European companies are ideally placed from a geographical perspective, but also commercial perspective, perspective to play an important role in Israel. At EMAC, for instance, in 2019, we have exported to Israel more than two tons of medical cannabis flowers. CBD wellness products have also been very popular in uh, Europe in the last three, four years. Startups have become multi-million revenue generating companies and big FMCG players have started putting their brands on CBD products. As an example of that, Boots, the largest pharmacy retailer in the UK, whom we at EMAC supply with multiple SKUs. The clarity provided by the European Court of Justice and the Nobel Food Path will allow for a rapid development of this segment in the coming years. On the back of these fantastic developments, we have seen an increasing interest from institutional investors and retail investors alike. There is a very strong appetite for opportunities to invest in the European cannabis space and be exposed to an industry that is undergoing a, world, a worldwide revolution. Europe is where North America was a few years ago, five to six years ago. And I expect that some of the early players, hopefully like EMAC, will emerge to become multi-billion companies and play a leading role, not just in Europe, but across the world. This is the time to invest in Europe. This is the time to invest in European cannabis industries. Thank you very much for your attention. Paul, back to you. Great, just waiting for my video to resume. There we go. That was fantastic, Antonio. Um, very brilliant and very insightful. If anyone had any doubt about the future growth prospects in Europe and in European cannabis, likely Antonio has overcome them. Uh, to quote Emily Dickinson, the truth dazzles sometimes gradually, but it's getting there. And just the array of countries that have already got medical cannabis programs is overwhelming. So this is without a doubt an incredible time and an inflection point to enter into Europe. We're going to move on to our panel to get some additional insights from other market participants. And I invite Antonio to stay on and contribute where appropriate uh, to our audience, should you have any questions. And we definitely encourage Q&A and we'll try to get to it at the end, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom rather than the chat, and we'll do our best to collate those questions and uh, direct them to the panel, time permitting. 
I'm going to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Ms. Janet Jackam, a partner at Zuber Lawler and Del Duca. Uh, Janet received the AV preeminent rating from Martindale Hubble. As an attorney, I can tell you that's a big deal. Uh, as she focuses in her practice on real estate acquisitions, leasing, equity, and debt financing, et cetera, but has been very active in the cannabis industry uh, regarding mergers, acquisitions, dispositions, and other deals. Um, Ms. Jackham supplements her legal insight with advanced technological, operational, and financial acumen, particularly to the cannabis industry. Her expertise in cannabis law has allowed her to represent clients in diverse topics, including matters relating to the cannabis dispensary certificate applications, bio transactions, business restructuring, and partner dispute resolution. Ms. Jackham is based in Phoenix and serves on the board of directors of Arizona Can the Arizona Cannabis Chamber of Commerce on the legal committee of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, otherwise known as NORML, as secretary of the Arizona Cannabis Bar Association, and until recently was a co-chair of the Meritus Cannabis Practice Steering Committee of North America, working with law firm affiliates across the United States. Very mm -hmm. excited to have Janet. Janet, please take it away. Thank you, Paul, for that great introduction uh, and for hosting today's panel discussion. We're very excited to welcome our distinguished panel. Let me first introduce Kingsley Wilson. Do we have him up? There he is. Hi there, Kingsley. Kingsley is a partner and co-founder of Crystal Capital Partners. Based in London, England, Kingsley advises over 500 family offices in the world on investments in cannabis and other opportunities. Challing Erklens. There he is, founder <laughs> and CEO of Bedrocon. Based in the Netherlands, Challing is an early proponent of cannabis product quality standards. Since 2003, Bedrocon has been providing standardized pharmaceutical quality cannabis to the Dutch government, patients, and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Joel Sherlock. There he is co-founder and CEO of Vitalis Extraction Technology and co-founder of Vancouver-based private equity fund, Doventi Capital. Vit Vitalis manufactures CO2 extraction equipment and Doventi Capital funds early stage private and public companies in the cannabis industry. And last but not least, certainly, Andrew Petronanos. There he is, founder and CEO of Fineleaf Consulting based in Zurich, Switzerland. Fineleaf is a European cannabis consulting and fundraising firm. And Andrew is also CEO and founder of Global Go Switzerland. Welcome to our panel. Shelling, I'd like to start with you first, if I may, and ask a question. As uh, Antonio mentioned this morning, Europe has recently seen a couple of uh, impactful decisions on the status of, the, of cannabis. <clears throat> These were issued by the Court of Justice of the European Union and by the United Nations. Tell us from your perspective what these decisions uh, amounted to and how they will impact both Betacons and Europe's growing cannabis industry. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Janet, for, uh, for asking. Um, let's start with the UN decision indeed, because I think, uh, and Antonio emphasized it the right way, um, it's, it's, it's not so much allowing the industry now, it, it's not licensing the industry to move forward. It only provides the industry, but that is a very important thing. It provides the industry with a status that it um, 
that it can operate now from a um, from a professional uh, from a professional level now uh, with a product that is accepted on a global level as having medicinal properties. So the discussion whether cannabis is medicinal or not is now behind us. That is a very very important achievement because this will allow the industry to start talking to the regulators, but not only to the regulators, also to, let's say, the educators, people that have to educate others uh, to deal with cannabis as a medicine, because that's one of the things that is lacking uh, uh, also, of course. And it allows an, another part of the industry to start making products that are wanted by the people so outside the medical space so more into the wellness side of things uh, opening up that market as well and and make it an um, a, an adult in that regard a grown-up market as well and that, that that's really important and but the other thing is that it sets the industry now on a next level and from that next level we we actually have to begin now do you expect uh, institutional investors from the US or Asia, for example, to uh, start commencing, or excuse me, to start their due diligence activities uh, on European cannabis companies? They already Is do. Is that a likelihood? <laughs> yeah, no, it's more than a likelihood they already do. There is... Um, um, there's serious interest from the U.S. We actually already, uh, Betterken is already dealing with, an, with a small uh, U.S. investment fund already since 2017, late 2017. But I also know that there is a uh, large interest from, um, let's say, the wealthier part of, of Asia uh, in order to, to get into this industry as well. Um, yes, definitely. But the European taste for, or the European appetite for investing is there too. I, uh, I, can, uh, I can testify to that. That's great. Kingsley, how are you there? I'm good. Just about to start enjoying my new wave of lockdown. So uh, <laughs> life in London gets tougher again. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, question for you, Kingsley. Will the uh, EU Court of Justice and the UN decisions be key drivers for um, institutional investors in the European cannabis market? Yeah, look, I think so. I mean, we, we've seen institutional money look at Europe, but I think, as Antonio said, the, the market is several years behind North America. So a lot of the institutional money has been looking at North America, but of course, it's been put offside from making the real big investments because of the federal illegality. So the institutional capital has really been sort of sitting on the sidelines mostly. That A few of them have been finding different vehicles and ways in which they can play the global space but they've been watching Europe, uh, and you know, Europe with 760 million people is twice the size of North America. So there's a lot of excitement about the size and the potential of the European market, but it's earlier stage, and people have been looking at the US market and the, and the Canadian market, but nervous about investing. But you know, that's again part of why we've launched Verdi Capital as an institutional quality fund focusing on the healthcare aspects of the global market. And a lot of that capital of our $200 million is going to head towards Europe. Remember, although there are certain countries that are starting to make noises about moving towards that rec market, the European market is very different to the North American one, which is very healthcare focused. So within that market, you know, you're looking at wellness products and brands, you're looking at medicinal markets and you're looking at the pharmaceutical markets. And so, again, there's quite a wide spread of different types of investment opportunities for that institutional capital to look at. And you're seeing a different type of market developing in Europe, you know, being very more focused on the medical and the health side of the market as opposed to the recreational side. But, but in answer to also your question, it's not just institutional capital that's starting to look. We are starting to see a lot of these big blue chip uh, companies from the pharmaceutical, tobacco, alcohol, FMCG, and that will also be a big wave. They too have been slightly sitting on the sidelines, but I'm sure as Tanning knows, a lot of them have created internally cannabis teams, whether it's BAT or Heineken or Trier or some of those companies, 
And those guys have been slowly and cautiously looking at this market. But again, with some of this regulatory news coming out, um, particularly in Europe over the last few weeks, I think that's kind of, it's, I know it's the starting pistol being fired, but it's the, it's the start of the real momentum now, I think. And I would imagine, just like we've seen some bigger institutions and some bigger blue chip other sector companies putting money into North America, we're going to start to see that coming in Europe, albeit that the European opportunities are a little earlier stage um, at the moment. So what you might find is that it'll be institutional capital like ours that comes in to provide that growth capital to grow these businesses to certain sizes. And then you'll see coming over the top, the, uh, I, I guess, the, the blue chip other sectors uh, across all of those other areas coming in and consolidating and buying up those businesses and those industries now. Thank you. I appreciate that. Those first adopters, uh, I, I heard you say some of the uh, Heineken, for example, I don't know, Coca-Cola, but are there actual institutional um, investors with whom you're either speaking or they've, they're out there already? Can you name them for us? Well, I can name us, but I capital. So we are an institutional $200 million fund focusing on, there on, you on go. that area. So <laughs> thanks for the plug, Janet. Um, but aside from us, you know, you're starting to see what I would, I would call more institutional names as in on the investment side, the Black Rocks, the Goldmans, and those big private equity institutional money haven't quite gotten themselves to that level of investment yet, again, because of the grayness, which partly gets removed, removed by this sort of news flow that we've had, um, but also just partly because of the size. So in, in, in our book, that will be a stepping stone to how these multi-billion dollar businesses that Antonio was talking about get created. They've got to start at that early stage. As Colleen said, you know, we're at the beginning now, so it'll be friends and family money, and it'll be, you know, the early VC and, and some early family money. Then the institutions will take over, and then those blue chip companies will come in and take over. And that's how these companies will progress to being large multi-billion dollar businesses in Europe to match a number of the large multi-billion dollar businesses that you've seen created over the last few years in North America. Thank you. Joel, I'll give you a few minutes too. Uh, you have built a successful technology business in the global cannabis marketplace. Do you think that, uh, is, is cannabis technology likely to become the sweetest investment spot for institutional investors in Europe? You know, I think cannabis technology is going to play a huge part in all of the investments in Europe. I mean, when we look at um, the differences and, and really the uniqueness of the European market with its medical focus, right, the technology required to make replicable medicines, um, you know, in the EU GMP environment, your technology provider and, uh, you know, and the technology you're building into your, to your lab spaces um, is very, very important, right? I mean, the, the ability to be able to keep that data, you know, for recalls, for product reliability, for product testing is going to be super, super important. And now you overlay that with, you know, the innovations that are happening in the space and, and the science that's pushing forward on, on both uh, you know, the understanding of the plant and how it works in the body, but also then manufacturing a lot of those products um, as, as, as the market changes. It's one of the only guarantees we have is change. You know, I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of the products that people will be making in a year from now are just being thought of or, or designed at the moment. Uh, interesting to me is whether there's going to be enough scientists and lab techs to go around to fund <laughs> fund these advances. Do you do you know whether the colleges, universities, uh, and other schools in in Europe is are are they are they gearing up? Are they uh, advertising for students? Yeah, <laughs> there there have been a lot of very interesting programs coming out. You know, specifically around you know, management of these types of businesses, production of, uh, you know, be it of plants or extracts. Um, but I, I think really where we're seeing successful teams coming together is where you see this melding of expertise. You know, you see someone who's got 20 years of, of pharmaceutical experience, you know, working and, and truly understanding somebody who has the cannabis experience. 
right? I mean, especially when, when we look at the, the section of the market that we sit in on the extraction space, you know, taking a cannabis plant with terpenes and cannabinoids and just all of the value that mother nature has provided um, versus, you know, just extracting a single volatile. It's a very, very different process in order to get a broad spectrum oil and then just to take, uh, you know, a whole bunch of birch wood and extract a single uh, or, or lavender to lavender oil or whatever it may be. So truly, you know, where we've seen a, a multitude of expertise is coming together and, and working together in a facility is, is really the winning teams that, uh, that we've, we've, we've seen. Do you uh, expect the regulators to be able to keep up with the technological changes? They're, they usually trail a little bit behind. Um, and, and, and at least now we're starting to see them talk to each other and, uh, you know, like Canada was early and, and we, we did some things very, very well. And, uh, we ultimately made, made some very, uh, big mistakes, you know, looking at the whole regulatory environment in the U S and, uh, you know, be it, uh, you know, the medicines authority in, in Denmark or, or, you know, NHS in, uh, in, in, in the UK, all of them uh, are, are sort of approaching it in their own unique style. Um, traditionally, though, I, I do think they, they could benefit from speaking and, and learning from each other's mistakes a little bit faster. Um, but again, each jurisdiction has its own challenges and, and its own opportunity. Great. Thank you. Andrew, I know you're meeting and consulting with European cannabis companies. Give us uh, some ideas uh, of the features of those companies that are most compelling and also least compelling to investors? First of all, uh, thank you. I mean, it, for me, it's a great honor to be here with such trailblazers from the industry, um, being more of a sort of newbie coming in the industry, but uh, having played a, a key role of understanding where the market is and helping companies establish themselves I think definitely what we see is medical cannabis is here to stay, especially in Europe. We just have to figure out what is the best way in order to deliver it. And the biggest question we all always have for any market entry is from doctor's perspective, can you give me enough data? You know, how, how can you prove to me that this is good enough? So I think companies that you know, are focusing on that uh, in order to, to deliver to the patient and deliver it well and creating a, a great ecosystem for that uh, will be the ones to succeed. Um, definitely, we, we fall into the complication between it still is, a, well, there still is a huge stigma in Europe when it comes to cannabis. We, we're not in the same position as, it, as they are in Canada or in California. You know, th there is still a, a huge, huge stigma that lies in politics and also regulators and people of authority. Uh, and of course, we're doing this webinar at a great time from the great news that came out of the United Nations and the EU. And suddenly you are seeing that allowance of growth again to happen. Um, but it still does depend on you know, how will each country now release a medical cannabis uh, program? And you have huge complications still. You know, I think uh, Antonio mentioned about jurisdictions like Greece or Italy. Actually, Italy is a bit more developed, but for Greece, for example, you have, I think, currently around 25 registered medical patients and 80 licenses given out to cultivate medicinal cannabis. Oh. But, you know, so suddenly you're seeing that and also from, a, from an investor's point of view, the biggest questions are, well, uh, is, it, is it safe? What are the returns? How will it happen? And what we always try to advise is just like we all know when you receive a medical cannabis therapy, the idea is always start low and go slow. So we say the same thing for everybody in the investment side in the industry. Look, you have to start slow, hopefully not go low because we are, we are requiring the capital in order to, to grow and also to have that capital in order to you know, lobby against the bigger pharma companies that if they come on board, suddenly you know, we'll start disappearing. Um, so that's, in all fairness, what we look at obviously is teams uh, from any investments, 
investor's point of view, and this is what we had a lot from people coming from the US, it's, you know, what is your track record? Uh, you know, show us the finances over three to five years. Who is in your team that, you know, can prove to me that you can hold an investment or you can grow your company? And um, so you, you have those people that come from that space. And then you have obviously all the people that do come from the illegal space that carry a lot of knowledge over 30 years of experience. Uh, and what I would always suggest is, yes, if you were growing illegally before, maybe you should partner up with somebody that has a science background or a business background to help you really develop a, a great business to stay for the next five to 10 years. Because cannabis, we're all here for the long game. I think uh, Europe is very different in comparison again to the US and Canada. We're not big uh, stock market uh, game, you know, let's, let's take a company public and let's uh, grow it. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I learned here in Switzerland is you have to, people are not interested for the quick exit. They're more interested to build a real business that is here to stay and slowly grow out. So what do you attribute that difference? Is it, is it cultural? Is the States is always, uh, uh, on the leading edge or crazy? <laughs> I think that uh, we'll actually I mean, Canada, we should a lot say, open-minded. You know, I mean, he, here Europe is still very, very conservative, <laughs> whether that's political or investment-wise. I mean, we have, like Kingsley knows, a lot of old family offices, a lot of old, old money that you know, grandfather is still there, or you know dad has taken over and you know, cannabis was you know a, a big no-no i mean even now after two years where the whole market has really developed in europe and acceptance is is you know has grown there is still there's a, still that big stigma it, it really lies there i mean i remember going to an investment network beginning of this year just to kind of you know probe a little bit and you know most of the company most of the asset managers were you know managing big funds and when i walked around and trying to look like them uh you know they said to me what are you investing in i say cannabis and i can tell you 80 percent of them didn't even want, didn't even want to say hey send us an email we're interested so yeah uh, there there was that part and then the second part was still a, a small cat industry so you're not not really fitting in there yet okay you're uh, you are uh, Switzerland's representative to Global Go. Um, can you tell us um, how uh, cannabis investors, cannabis companies can uh, tap into your network? Absolutely, and actually, it's important to say because for us, you're coming into the industry quite new. Uh, a lot of the questions were asked like, you know, who are you, what have you done in cannabis before? And actually creating an alliance with Global Go and having, having the people that do represent Global Go in a you know, quick conversation or a, it gives us a lot of grounding on what we're trying to achieve. And what is really great to see is that all the members of Global Go, um, like Paul Rosen or Tom Zuber or Steve D'Angelo, all you know, want to show the lessons that they have learned over the years. And what we try to do is help also companies and regulators in the European industry develop from those lessons and hopefully do it better. Um, and, and from our, I mean, when we first started, from our perspective, it, you know, we could definitely have the bigger cannabis companies out of Europe rather than Canada or, or America. We, we have great know-how, we have great scientists, we have great land, um, and it's all about you know, developing our ecosystem at the same time and, and protecting what we have, especially the you know, genetics and, and science development in drugs. Thank you. Chaling, I see you there nodding your head. So I, I think because you're nodding your head, you're in agreement with the other speakers but I think you should speak your mind if you want to uh, uh, address any of their issues that, that were discussed. <clears throat> yeah, it's um, what, what actually Kingsley is saying, what 
Joel is saying, what actually everybody is saying, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a developing market. The European market is rather conservative. It has a, it has a background of, let's say, organic growth. It is, we see it happening uh, around us. The regulatory, uh, the regulatory boundaries are strict. If we, if I just mentioned the Netherlands where it started back in 2003, uh, although the, the program went live, it started already in 1997 when, when the initiative was there. Um, you can see, especially the regulators being very, very hesitant and conservative in the beginning, uh, and they influence capital. It's, 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 a, it's a very common thing. If regulators say, oh, we don't know, then the investor will say, oh, we'll wait a bit. That is actually what has happened over the, the, the past decades, actually, in Europe, although there was some legalization. Well, the, the Netherlands, of course, was one of the first to, to do it this way. Um, and But there was also non-belief. Um, and that is where we also, as a company, said we cannot deal with belief. We need science now. So we, 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 we tapped into science already since 2004. Um, bringing us to the level where we are right now. And I also firmly believe that cannabis is an add-on to other industry, already existing industry. And then you're talking the pharmaceutical industry, if you look from the medical perspective. Um, <laughs> having said that, pharmaceutical companies are still very hesitant due to, uh, to, the, to the UN regulations, for instance, and more local regulations also. So that is all changing right now. And that is where it's still a slow process of the industry step for step building up right now, having the investors be, being backed up by investors and not the wrong, you need the right investors for this. You need the, the investors that have a longer term vision, not for two or three years, because this is not how this industry will develop. It's, an, it's, it's not only novel food, it's also novel medicine. And in that regard, uh, we really need, as an industry, we need definitely more time to grow. And I would urge people to um, to look at from from that perspective. It's 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 it will be. You cannot push this grow. It's still a controlled substance. Cannabis has not been removed from the controlled substances list. So it, it, that all will follow being follow up by regulations as well. I am sure that the UN. This is not the only declaration by the UN we have seen. There will come more now. They will start regulating also to governments, to, to their member states, uh, in order to have everything aligned on a global scale. And that makes me really happy. But it also tells me that this is not going to be a, a one or two year uh, uh, thing. It will take much more time before this is fully regulated, compared to the FDA and the federal, the federal level where the US is right now. Basically, that's where we are in Europe as well. I'd throw this question out to the panel. Uh, is there a company's regime, excuse me, a country's regime the best in your mind? Is there a prototype of the best regulatory regime? For now, in Europe, I don't think so. To be very honest, maybe Germany comes close, but my preference goes to Australia. I'm actually a fan of Australia. I see that Australia has taken a very um, rigorous approach. They just said it's a pharmaceutical product. We need to treat it that way. But we also are aware of the complications of this product being a multi-compound product uh, and in that way, being effective for patients. Australia took the right approach. They are, they are not discussing REC because that is confusing. If you, if you have a discussion about REC and medical at the same time, it's very confusing. It's two different products, two different type of consumers. So Australia took the medical route. They did it. They informed themselves properly from the beginning. And later on, they, they, I, I, of course, you, you can have a lot of criticism on every government right now. But I think they have been taking the most bold steps while staying within the boundaries of pharmaceutical and medical products and having 
com a compassionate ear for for any and all patients there. I think, yeah, from my perspective, it's Australia. Kingsley, Andrew. Yeah, I, mean, I, like, I think I think what, one of the interesting things we're seeing is that you know this this sort of ending of prohibition has happened quite slowly. You look at markets like California. You know, they were quite a long time ago, and, and everyone puts in place some sort of program, and there are bits that work and bits that doesn't work. But what we're now starting to see is that kind of you're about to hit that, you know, acceleration curve. Obviously, with recent news, we expect more and more countries now to start putting in place medical programs. And the one benefit they've all got is they can look in the rear view mirror and look at other countries and see which parts worked and which parts didn't work. So while there's a real mix mash of regulation, whether it's in South America or even state by state or, or Canada or Australia, nothing's perfect. Not even Germany, which is the big market in Europe, but, but I think going forward, we're going to start to see better things happen. More countries are going to consult and go, right, let's cherry pick the best bits. Let's work out what we should definitely not do. And let's put in place a program like that. So again, hopefully everything starts to sort of get that exponential growth. And just to revert back to the, the capital piece for, 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 for companies in Europe, you know, the one thing they haven't really had that, that you had in the US and, and Canada is that access to public market capital. Now, a lot of them are early stage and we saw what goes wrong. If you're an early stage company that goes public with wonderful forecasts, turns out you've actually got to go and deliver on those forecasts or, uh, you know, your share price suffers. But again, the London Stock Exchange just put out recent guidance about six weeks ago for the first time opening up that kind of that gray area that Fallon was talking about, which is, well, we didn't know what companies we could bring onto the exchange because we're not getting the right guidance. And now they've they've come out saying that they will admit, you know, medicinal wellness and pharmaceutical companies to the London Stock Exchange. Again, there are always the usual bells and whistles of grayness saying that so long as they're they're equivalent to the home office license that have medical equivalency, but you're starting to see some exchanges opening up as well. And that'll increasingly happen. So that will give these companies access to more capital. And, and you know, if we can get com you know, countries putting in place good legal frameworks where companies can get going a lot quicker and not hit the, the road bumps that, for example, the UK did when it legalized in November 2018, no one had really thought about what that meant and the infrastructure that you have to have in place. And then it takes two or three years for everyone to work it all out and, and pick their way through it. So going forward, We'll see more countries with better legal frameworks, with good companies coming in that can quickly generate revenues and profits and quickly access this coming institutional capital and the public market capitals around in Europe as well. So again, it all starts to look better, but you're right. And I mean, this is a, this is a multi-year process to catch all of that value, which is again, why we, in our fund, it's a seven year fund. We're not trying to trade on the next quarter or try and cherry pick the winner in the next year. If you really want to capture all the value, you've got to take that longer term view and invest and play through that cycle. Thank you. Andrew or Joel? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think one other thing to add on, it's, it's not only you know, how the regulator has it, but when we talk about medical cannabis, you've got to start considering who are the gatekeepers. Because one is a regulator, but then you have the doctors. So if you don't have the doctors and educate the doctors for them to start saying, okay, well, I know what medication is out there. I have uh, companies that have invested to make sure that some clinical trials are happening or you have more data collected and then convince and educate the doctors, but also educate the consumers. Because what we have two completely different markets. You have the recreational market, which is somebody that wants to elevate themselves. And you have people that, you know, that we, I, I know Challenge is fighting for is to allow the medicine part of cannabis for the people that really need it. You know, and, and there you, you have a huge differentiation. And of course, as soon as you produce a medical uh, pilot program, you have all the people that saying, okay, great. So now I can get access to cannabis. So I don't have to go to the street. So I'm going to apply for it. And then they fall not getting it or some people get it. And then the regulator falls into this. Oh, is it gray? Is it not? Should I? Are people just you know, getting high with what I've done and what about the people that really need it? And then on the health insurance side is how can you, you know, you have to start convincing the health insurance that by putting somebody from a cannabis therapy, they are starting to get convinced that they should support it. 
And growing on the capital side, what, what we are seeing also here in Switzerland, people know we have some of the largest pension funds in the world. If you start convincing those pension funds that each citizen is getting a better well-being uh, by having a cannabis therapy, then I think we're going to start attracting a lot more of that institutional capital. Joel, any comments? It's a, it's a great point. I mean, it, very similar to what I was going to bring up. I mean, it's physician education is, is such a key point and, and patient capital, but also just, you know, for, for the producers to be thoughtful stewards of, of the medicine that they're making, right? I mean, any, any product recalls or, or any shortcuts in, uh, you know, your, your exporting practices, right? I mean, we've seen a couple of those failures and that really just slows down the regulators. It slows down physician adoption, you know, so really focus on quality and, and understand that, you know, the, the importance of this medicine, both to the industry, but most importantly to the patients. Um, but, you know, I think that's going to be the key to physician education, to unlocking some of uh, the regulators who may be still stuck. Um, and then also just be building trust in the, in, in the broader sense, you know, between the, the physicians, the, the community, the insurance companies, you know, all of that is, is going to be key. Uh, gentlemen, is banking an issue in Europe for cannabis companies? And is it uh, an impenetrable obstacle to getting institutional investments? If I may, uh, banking was an issue in the, in the very early stages. Actually, insurance was an issue on our end. A very weird experience when you're hired by the government and you get a contract and then your insurance company tells you, <laughs> mm, no, we don't do that. And then actually we had, actually, we had a great bank at that time. Um, we, when we were hired by the Dutch government, we ended up on their ethical page, on their ethical section in, because they wanted to support it. Um, but I still see also in Europe slight problems here and there, but it's more individual than I think corporate policy from banks. I think nowadays any, any legal cannabis company in Europe will not have the issues that you have been facing in the US. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been an interesting road in the Canadian space. Uh, you know, in the early days, it was federally legal here. And, uh, you know, we were servicing the market with, with two companies and we were kicked out of a bank uh, for being high risk investors. So it, it's still, you know, it, it's a very capital uh, heavy business to get into, be it, you know, the, the controlled growing rooms of, of Vedrican or, or the extraction machines behind me. You know, it, it gets... Uh, we don't traditionally have uh, like normal food or, or uh, pharmaceuticals would be able to go and get sizable amounts of leverage at, at usually, you know, reasonable debt rates that that hasn't quite yet broken its way into the into the cannabis production markets. Um, you know, I, I definitely think it, it it is coming and it is softening, um, but it's not quite there yet, which is why, you know, it relies on a lot of the capital we're talking about of, of family offices or, or private equity funds. I, I Andrew, did you want to comment? Yeah. I can definitely say from my recent experience, actually trying to help uh, a UK company establish itself in uh, Switzerland. So no, we don't touch the plant. Uh, banking or opening a bank account has been extremely difficult. Uh, and even some, I'm not going to name any of the banks, but some of the larger banks here in Switzerland that at the beginning of the year had advertising all over the cities saying we also support cannabis. So, uh, you know, I, I did approach them and they said, yeah, mm, let, let us check. And it goes back and forth in compliance. And then they come back and say, well, actually, we're still taking a very cautious approach, which is, you know, which is the same for any institutional investor. So then you see smaller banks say, you know what, we'll take the risk and we will help you out. But it's, it's definitely not easy. Uh, you, you have to figure out all the loopholes in order to actually push it through. And no bank manager is really still to this day because of the whole stigma wanting to, you know, say, okay, yeah, it's cannabis, I get it. You're fully clean. You, you, you have no one from the illegal market, no criminal records, nothing. But actually it still writes cannabis, so it gets flagged out with compliance. So, so it, it is still an issue from... from some of our experience anyway. 
Thank you, gentlemen. I think we need to move to the question and answer period. Uh, David Boucher asks, where can we have or get the market information concerning Europe? Mm, that's that's a good question, actually. Um, it's it's <coughs> Europe is not unified in this regard. So uh, for the I think for the for the medical part of things and you want you want regulatory information on the medical side of things, you should call Brussels. You should call the I think the either the, the EMA or the or the, the European Union offices itself. Um, local information is always on on in you have to start in government offices and uh, and see where the regulations uh, are and see where they are going. Um, again, Charling, still... Charling, excuse me, let me interrupt. Do your regulators in Europe, and I, I realize we're dealing with a lot of different countries, but do the regulators issue annual reports, for example, on the current status of, of the marketplace? No, not in uh, the Netherlands, definitely not. They just don't do it. Um, I haven't seen that type of information from Germany either. Um, I think that actually one of the best informed groups is MJ Biz Daily. <laughs> it's the one that, that offers most information number wise uh, on a regular basis. Yes, it's on my I, I think I think in Germany they put out something, don't they, some quarterly numbers on number of prescriptions written and the and the rebates on those prescriptions, which then everyone tries to extrapolate into the size of the market. But they're probably the best in terms of data, and that's pretty scant data in itself for people to guess, mate. And then you, you're on, uh, you know, prohibition partners or new frontier data. A lot of those guys just trying to size the market, but again, those 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 spreads of sizing of the market in individual countries are, I, I'm not sure on what data those are based off. Yeah. I would say, you know, the patient data is something that would be more readily available, but start not, not widely available. I mean, you know, Germany's done a good job of, of putting out some of those numbers. Um, but I'd have to, I'd have to agree with Chawling that, you know, MJ biz or prohibition partners, or, you know, there's, there's some great reporters in, uh, you know, unbiased factual, you know, Alfredo has been fantastic in, in his coverage of the sector. Um, yeah, but I, definitely more information would be would be fantastic, but uh, slow slow progress. Andrew, does Global Go prepare such? Yeah, a I think yeah, from our side, we we are actually at this current stage trying to put together a, a sort of annual report to go out next year. But like everybody knows, you're collecting actual market data in Europe. I think even for some of the international companies, I'm so sure Joel's had some experience. You don't really know. I mean, you know, you don't. Is it correct? Is it how many patients? I mean, I would be. I think one would be the regulators, and then the second would be the sort of import export authorities. It'd be very interesting to know how much has actually been imported in the country that has gone to the right end user, um, and how much of it actually has been destroyed. And it's 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 very interesting. I think we're definitely seeing growth we all do know that you know we see how many companies have filed for a novel foods application uh we're seeing some how many companies are filing for wholesale distribution licenses to come in to different jurisdictions we're seeing new pharmacies coming into play that want to handle cannabis and then i think the key part is also how many doctors are really putting their hand out there that are wanting to really you know, put out prescriptions I think, I think Janet, I, I take a slightly contrarian view in terms of the way we look at the market. The, the more that there's federal illegality and uncertainty, the, the banking uncertainty, the lack of data, we think gives investors who are dedicated and focused on the space that extra edge to actually go and do the work themselves and work out where the real opportunities are and get their money to work. So, again, we quite like this gray area that exists around the industry at the moment. Um, for the next couple of years at least while we deploy our money and then we'll turn we'll work out you know if we made the right decisions or not but i think it's that lack of knowledge and uncertainty that kind of keeps a lot of the investors on the sideline and leaves the door open for the more entrepreneurial investors to now participate and and, and invest in the sector 
and I must say also in Kingsley's point is, you know, I, I think those are the companies you would want to back as well. The companies that have, that can really say to you, look, I have done my own research of my market and this is where I see it going and this is what I back it on. And you know, I, I think those you'll find will probably be the winners coming in the next few years. Tristan Gervais asks, are the floodgates finally opening for European cannabis IPOs in London? Kingsley, I think that's your area. Uh, I wouldn't know if they're the floodgates, but I would say that, you know, clearly as we discussed earlier, the stock exchange has at least opened the doors to be receptive to companies. And I think we're going to start to see some interesting companies coming. We're working with a number. Some might be pharmaceutical companies from Australia. Some might be grow operations from Jersey Island beneath the UK um, and indeed, indeed other better and larger European focused uh, companies as well. Um, so I think it'll be an interesting first three to six months in London on the stock exchange. We could go from no listings uh, of anything to speak of to four or five or six. And I suspect there will be that wall of institutional capital that will back them. A lot of the institutional money that back public companies haven't been really able to invest in Canada uh, or on the US exchanges. But once those uh, cannabis companies come to the you know the UK market and on the London Stock Exchange, we're going to probably see some pretty interesting capital raises and some pretty exciting share price performances. We just hope that they also live up to expectations and they they learn from some of the prior mistakes on other exchanges in terms of how you guide the market, how the brokers talk to the market, and how they get the right message out there that they can execute and deliver against. Well, it's 11 o'clock. Paul, do you want us to keep moving? <laughs> it's 11 o'clock uh, mountain time. Uh, I think we could go for a few more minutes. All Very right. Very fascinating conversation. Yes. Let's keep going. Thank you. We'll wrap it up soon, but let's, let's keep going. We have more questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have an anonymous attendee asking, uh, Verdite seems like a great way to play cannabis secular growth opportunity. Given low valuations and a lack of growth capital available, could Verdite be a five to 10 times vintage fund? Um, I think, you know, we, we do see that being a growth capital fund in the market at the moment brings a lot of differentiation. There aren't too many cannabis funds around full stop, very few that are focused exclusively on the healthcare side. There are obviously some focusing on um, adult use MSO roll-up. So we think we sit in a unique position. We think we've got a, you know, being based here in Europe, we've got a pretty good access to the European deal flow, which is where we've, if we've been discussing, should get stronger and better. Um, so again, we think we're going to be in a position to capitalize on this, I guess, this cannabis boom and bust that's happened. We now sort of sit and start to invest our $200 million at, you know, at low valuations in companies that are well run with strong growth in markets where they're struggling to get access to people who will write 10, 15, $20 million tickets, which is what our fund is focused on. So again, from that position, we'd like to think that we will generate very strong returns. Of course, I'd like to think we will do five or 10 times people's money, but you know, there's obviously still risk in the system um, just from an operational and company standpoint as well as the sort of changing regulatory environment. So um, it all comes down to the team and the ability to monitor and track these deals. Writing a check is relatively easy. We can all do that. It's monitoring and sitting with the boards of these companies and helping guide them and steer them and help them create value geographically and vertically through the value chain and then position them for an exit, whether that's uh, on a stock exchange or to perhaps one of the big cannabis companies in the world or big you know, alcohol, tobacco, uh, FMCG or pharma businesses, we think more of those uh, types of investors will come in. So again, the, the scene is set for some strong performance in cannabis for investors. Thank you. Uh, Goran Stoymanov has asked the following. Um, I think that we can introduce pension funds, great presentation, how holistic approach and mixed treatments with regular normal convention way and mixed with cannabis. 
so that we don't scare them. Joel, that's your one, I think. Pardon me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kingsley. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the the pension funds still. I mean, I, we, we've we've seen a lot of them looking at the space, but I mean, depending on what provisions they have in place for, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, definitely most of the time, non-recreational market, uh, any any type of recreational exposure would would be a no-no. Um, I'm very excited to see those pension funds get more active in the space. Haven't seen many, if any, uh, in a big way. But uh, you know, going back to what Kingsley was saying, I think I think he's hit the nail on the head with that. These sort of disjointed, very early stage markets do provide some some phenomenal phenomenal opportunity for those who find good stewards of capital and, and can truly understand the fragmented market and, and really, you know, see where the opportunity lies. Paul, it's back to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much uh, for an incredible, oh, they got my video going again. All right. Um, well, that was fascinating. Uh, we could have obviously kept going on. We had great engagement from the audience and that's always a good indication that we're mining an important subject matter. Um, I, I, what I would take away is that Europe is inevitable. It is going to become a big, massive market, and it's probably going to create some enormous companies. And Europe has a few advantages that maybe we didn't have in Canada, which is they can study what happened in Canada <laughs> uh, and learn uh, both what are the best practices that they ought to embrace. And this is from every aspect of the economy, including how to raise capital, when to go public, but also down to the granular level, what to grow, how to extract. Uh, and they can also hopefully edit some of the practices that took some of the sort of uh, enthusiasm out of the Canadian markets when a lot of our early public companies went on sort of a buy everything at any pr anywhere, any price buying spree. And we'll say this is just your typical uh, machinations of an early industry. And it shouldn't shock or concern, in my opinion, investors, but um, we now are years later from when we started having pubcos in Canada and the literacy, the professionalism, the professional class, and the understanding about what a global cannabis entity can look like has really never been stronger. And so the companies that are forming in Europe right now, they really have this incredible opportunity because they can look backwards at what worked and what did not work. And they can really start to craft strategies that are going to emphasize the positive and minimize the negative. And for investors, you know, it, in my opinion, um, you got to look at this as a long-term investment rather than a quick trade. We've had a lot of volatility in the industry, and as everyone knows, fortunes have been made and fortunes have been lost. But if you're playing the long-term trend as a value investor, there is value in Europe right now uh, because there's in inevitably going to be a massive formation of a market. And I would predict almost with certainty that if you jump five years hence from today's date, you're going to probably see the largest single recreational cannabis market in the world, if you include the EU. So a number of the countries that were enumerated right now, let's not lose sight of the fact that they're still in a medical only uh, uh, regulatory program. But I have no doubt that there is going to, regulators are going to see the advantage of expanding beyond their medical platform to a full-blown adult use platform. And they can certainly look at countries like Canada and the United States to see that the type of harm that they may anticipate, which would come commensurate with an uh, adult use market, simply not going to materialize. In fact, in fact, quite the opposite. It's just going to be a win-win-win. So right now, if people look at Europe and they're kind of like a little bit meh about the current financial performance, that's the opportunity. Because does anyone that's in the industry really believe that in five years from now, Europe is not going to be seismically larger than it is right now? If you don't, hey, you know, don't invest, don't be interested. I'm certainly beyond bullish on what the prospects of Europe are. And I think that it is going to create just dynamic economic growth, dynamic potential for investors. And um, provide incredible benefits to the patients and consumers that live on the continent. So 
what I take away from today is we're going to have to have another webinar about Europe, because while we began to scratch the surface, we haven't come close to really covering the incredible uh, array of topics uh, that are relevant to investors and operators. So you can look forward to an additional Global Go webinar featuring more thought leaders in Europe in, in 2021. I want to thank our panelists, our keynote, and also our sponsors that helped produced today, specifically Crystal Capital, Zuber Lawler, uh, Arcview Group, CFN Media Group, and as mentioned, Last Prisoners Project. Try to support that incredibly important organization. Let's keep in mind that there are people incarcerated for doing what we're celebrating today. We've got to solve that as quickly as possible. Good karma around that for the growth of the industry. Until next time, I'm Paul Rosen, the Executive Chairman of Global Go. I hope everyone enjoyed today's content. Wishing everyone a great holiday season. Stay safe, and we'll pick it up again early in the new year. Thanks so much. Thank you.